don't really understand how I ended up here. Dashing around. And losing sight of myself in the process. You know, I think that's been the story of my whole life. Strap in if you haven't seen the first part of the final series of The Crown because it is intense, insanely intense. Hello, by the way, welcome to my YouTube channel. I am Dr. Tessa Dunlop. Yes, I was lucky enough to get a sneak preview of the first four episodes and I openly admit I sobbed, I wept and of course I knew the ending already. The point of this film is to try and deduce beyond the story arc that we already know, the tragic ending, is to try and deduce just how much of the rest is accurate. The first thing this series I thought absolutely nailed was the insanity of that period. Those long nose lenses, the paparazzi, like bees swarming, moths to a flame. That was the reality. Diana was everywhere. Refractured through her divorce, through her new love life, through Dodie, through leopard skin swimsuits. It was just like coming at you everywhere. And then suddenly, overnight, boom, it was over. No wonder we didn't know what to do with us as we were just hanging outside of Kensington Palace weeping. And no wonder Harry feels left out because he was just a kid. I thought again that was captured really well. We're gonna come back to Harry in a minute. Hold that thought. But first, all good series need a baddie or two. And I thought The Crown played this in a very canny way. No one in the royal family is a baddie in this series. Do we think that Peter Morgan might be trying to backpedal and get a knighthood? I'll leave you thinking about that one. The real, the key baddie beyond the press, obviously they are the arch kind of demons. And this is before the era of phone hacking, incidentally. The baddie other than the press, Mohammed Al-Fayed, yes. The bereaved father as he so impressively cast himself post August 1997, but in fact someone who was positively Machiavellian in reality. He was obsessed with getting a pound of royal flesh into his very own multi-billion pound dynasty. This is the Egyptian man made good. He owned Harrods, he owned the Ritz in France. He had everything he wanted except Diana. So he used his pretty weak son and Dodie is portrayed to be very weak in this film. But that cranks up the space to make Mohammed the baddie, the, the puppeteer, if you like. And my, all my royal sources tell me, yeah, he was feeding the press where they were. That picture of that kiss at the time, in the Sunday Mirror, they wrote, you only have to look at the sensual body language to know that they have found physical and spiritual fulfillment in each other. We wouldn't have had that picture had it not been for Mohammed Al-Fayed. And what was he doing here, by the way, feeding the press? Well, he was trying to ensure that it became a reality, that Dodie and Diana weren't just having a flirtation, but actually by making it public, by articulating it, sort of, if you like, creating a fait accompli, before necessarily either of them were ready for that. So we have him as the baddie. That's pretty accurate in terms of this relationship. But of course, retrospectively, he's also a man who loses his son. And I think his role, that overstepping the mark, betraying his son and Diana, if you like, helps explain his crazy levels of grief. He never reconciled himself with the deaths of Dodie and Diana. And I think a lot of death anyway, even if you're not Mohammed al fayed a lot of death is about guilt. And he was carrying this guilt. Okay, so the primary baddie, the key Machiavellian player, is Mohammed Al-Fayed. And that is really great news for King Charles. And I am absolutely convinced that Peter Morgan kind of got the memo. Hey, by the way, that dude, the Prince of Wales, he is now king. Don't cross the king. As a result, we have an exoneration of Charles. We know that the last series, Series 5, was heavily criticised because of its timing, because of the insensitivity of raking around and Prince Philip's possible roving eye as an older man with Penny Romsey just after the Queen had died. So arguably the Crown has some making good and I think they've done that around their portrayal of Charles. He wants to do divorce well. Um, he's trying to be all accommodating as well as trying to, yes, introduce the idea of Camilla to the public, something that we always struggled with at that time. And then, of course, there's his role encouraging the Queen to understand the enormity of Diana's death. This is going to be the biggest thing that any of us has ever seen. Just how realistic is that portrayal? I think certainly Charles understood how big the death was. 
He was a guy who'd basically been in the shadows for well over a decade because his wife was the epic megastar, not him, the man born to wear the crown. So he definitely would have been one of the few people at Balmoral in the wake of Diana's death who got it. But in terms of this kind of softer, cuddly, likeable Charles, that was not tallying with the reality at the time. We despised our future king. And more than that, we despised his relationship with Camilla. I was looking at some polling that was done by The Sun uh, just a week after the death of Diana, and it throws up some pretty stark results. 57% thought that it would harm the monarchy if he continued with Camilla, and 66% thought he should not become king if he married Camilla. And yet, in this series, Charles is super lovable. So to the relationship between Diana and Dodie. How much was fact? How much was fiction? One of the great escapes that Morgan has got here is that he can introduce an element of fantasy because the two key protagonists went to their death, taking their secret with them. None of us really know. But we do know that in this series of The Crown, Diana was wrapping up the relationship. She was giving old Dodie in his moccasins the heave ho. How true was that? Well, again, this is Morgan, I think, working his relationship with the current royal family. Because if you look at the narrative, it splits in two. All those on Diana's side and in the royal family wanted to play down the likelihood of that couple ever going for happily ever after stuff. But yet, Muhammad al Fayed, he absolutely released the idea early on that they were engaged. Yes, mooted the idea that she was pregnant. They'd hardly been dating for more than a minute or two. So the bottom line is, Morgan's taken the narrative that we've been sold by the establishment, which heaven for Fenn did not want Dodell fired, marrying the mother of the future king. I can assure you they really didn't want that. And they have not gone with Mohammed al Fayed's preferred narrative. The uncomfortable truth about Dodi, uh, he was initially two-timing Diana. He did have a girlfriend, Kelly Fisher. She did try and sue him for dumping the so-called engagement. Apparently there were two yachts. I mean, you couldn't make it up, so why would the Crown bother to make it up? But the bits that we don't know, they've had fun with that. We simply don't know how serious it was in Diana's head. According to Peter Morgan, not so serious. I'm sure William will be relieved. Elizabeth Debecki in this film looks absolutely amazing, by the way. It took me a while to adjust my eye to her being Diana in series five, but now I'm totally there. Just like Diana in her 30s, she kind of owned it. The Chanel, the classic gold jewellery, the swimsuits, she rocked. So did Diana. So let's now go back to that insane juxtaposition that the boys were living. They wake up in Balmoral and they discover that their mother has died. The only account we've got of what really happened is from Harry's spare. Peter Morgan, when he was filming the sixth series, didn't have spare because he filmed it just before the book came out. So let's just recap and check in with Harry. Pa didn't hug me. He wasn't great at showing emotions under normal circumstances. How could he be expected to show them in a crisis? But his hand did fall once more on my knee and he said, it's going to be okay. That was quite a lot for him. Fatherly, hopeful, kind, and so very untrue. He stood and left. I don't recall how I knew that he'd already been in the other room, that he'd already told Willie, but I knew. In the film, of course, Willie and Charles go in to tell Harry. And what's interesting is the depiction and the focus in these first four episodes on William, William the adolescent. And it is true, he did really struggle. One of the reasons for the royal family's delayed reappearance in London was because William went walkabouts. He went walking in the hills. He was really struggling to come to terms with the idea of his mother's death. Can you blame him? Being an adolescent's tough enough at the best of times. So that depiction, which I think is incredibly sensitively done, is an accurate one by all accounts. And the call to return to London when it finally came, a day late really, it came from the Queen. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. This week at Balmoral, we have all been trying to help William and Harry come to terms with the devastating loss that they and the rest of us have suffered. Harry was a, a much more minimal character and I thought yeah okay Flynn Edwards did his best 
looked like he was wearing a wig. But anyway, it was a minor part, Harry's role here. We see him after the death, just sitting on a sofa playing Game Boy. I, there was something quite accurate about that. And if you read Spare, it kind of cleverly predicts this kind of little lost lad, not really understanding what's going on. And I think that this series of The Crown, the biggest takeaway for me, or one of them, is the way in which it helps make sense of Harry's belated grief. This extraordinary public outpouring in film form, also on Netflix, of course, in his book, because he couldn't back then. He was too young. It didn't make sense. And then he was like bundled back off to prep school or something by casting him in this really kind of hardly there presence that helped make sense of where Harry was at then and now. Incidentally, if you're feeling shortchanged that there was not enough of our favourite spare, don't because the second set of episodes from series six drops in December and then we scale up Harry into an adolescent. He's going to be played by Luther Ford, William, his brother, by Ed McVeigh. Of course, there will be that certain fancy dress party with that certain unfortunate costume and the introduction of the character Kate Middleton masses to look forward to. This, by all accounts, is the final series, but I think we've heard that before. And I just can't believe that there won't be a seventh series featuring a certain Meghan Markle. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, then do please give it a like and a subscribe. And I really hope to see you again.